We are discussing Tucker Carlson's bombshell interview with Democratic presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. We discussed his comments on Ukraine bioweapons and his thoughts on the Russia-Ukraine war more generally earlier today. Be sure to check that out. But later in the interview, Kennedy took aim at the current economy and how the working class is being crushed by a cost of living crisis. Let's watch. The average wage in this country is now $5,000 left less than the cost of, um, of basic goods, of food, transportation, and housing. So half of Americans are making up that gap by putting it on their credit card bills. And this week, we passed $1.1 trillion in credit card debt. That's the first time in history. Most of that, or $330 billion of that, has been in the Biden and Trump administration. Two men who are saying, I, you know, I've, I'm helping America. The trillion dollar in credit card debt, and those people are paying 22% interest. If the mafia did that, it would be called loan sharking. Not dischargeable in bankruptcy, by the way. Right? And it can't be discharged. So you're, I'm meeting people who are, you know, couples who are sitting at their dining room tables and trying to figure out how, how this math works for them because they can't. They're, they're having to make choices. People in this country are choosing between food and gasoline and, and food and medicine. It's wonderful to hear him talking about that. Um, people on the left have been proposing caps on credit card interest rates for some time. Back in 2019, AOC and Bernie Sanders uh, proposed a bill to do exactly that. Unfortunately, although it's getting a sympathetic hearing on the Tucker Carlson show in this context, these are not the kind of policies that have been broadly backed by conservatives who tend to fall back on the line that you got to pay back your own debts. Now, here, obviously, the, the issue isn't paying back the base sum. It's whether or not poorer people are faced with more usurious interest rates by wealthy people, historic, wealthier people historically get very favorable terms. This is a similar issue as what's happening with student debt, where student debtors are, using, are faced with something like 8% interest, interest rates from at least my generation of student debtors, where homeowners, et cetera, because of the kind of upper middle class lobbying interest on their behalf, have, tend to be able to benefit from much lower interest rates, at least as comparably, even though they're still suffering right now, but comparably to people like student debtors. So, I mean, I don't entirely know what to make of this. I want to just accept it as good news, but I do have some skepticism that this kind of rhetoric in this context being accepted so positively is more about digging at Biden, which is fine, but I want, him, I want it to be about actively fighting to implement policy if one were to actually be in a position of power, like so many Republicans and Democrats are in power right now. Well, don't you think RFK Jr. and Tucker, I mean, I, I think they legitimately disagree with what the people in power in both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party want to do with respect to this issue and probably a wide range of economic issues. It's, it's true. It's true. But I, I'm sorry I've been burned. Donald Trump, like I say so many times, he ran I think really smartly on a lot of populist issues. But then he got into office and it turned out to be a kind of a faux populism. And this is why people are constantly trying to suss out whether or not someone is genuine, whether or not they have integrity or whether or not it's a kind of a grift. And you look at people's backgrounds and you try to get a sense of that. So with someone like RFK Jr., his multi-decade history of fighting on certain kind of environmental justice issues, I think gives him a lot of credibility in that sector. Whether or not in certain other areas there's that same level of credibility, I don't know. Some of the way that he's described problems for the economy make people on the left think, well, he fundamentally believes in the system as it is. He believes in um, kind of the, the same sort of conservative feeling rhetoric about building up small businesses as a way to change the economy instead of addressing some of these structural issues. Why is it that poor people face higher interest rates, that wealthier people can get loans? Um, that uh, people like Larry Summers have been arguing for more unemployment to save the economy. And now that we've had de-inflation without the massive unemployment that he was advocating for, he's having to eat crow and say, oh, I don't know, it was based on some economic models that aren't exactly accurate. Don't, don't come at me, don't come at me. But those, that's the kind of rhetoric that elites, the very wealthy, have been using to direct our economic system since time immemorial. And are we going to believe that a Kennedy, someone who's very wealthy, who benefits from the tax code as it is, the same way Donald Trump did, is actually going to meaningfully change the reality of the situation. I mean, it's a, your first question has not, doesn't have such a mysterious answer, right? It's that w wealthier people 
can afford to pay back, or there's gr greater trust from the, in the part of the people making the loan that the money will be repaid. There's higher interest rates because they're reflecting the greater overall risk of the loan not being repaid, right? Sure. Yeah. Sure. And if you treat things like health care, education, and housing as something other than a human right, then you are very comfortable with the idea of the markets deciding that you can get to a place with truly usurious interest rates, where people are paying many, many times the bulk of the original balance. I mean, a 22% interest rate, is that really calculated to the risk profile? Perhaps you shouldn't extend the loan in the first place rather than getting people hooked into the system and being able to charge them over the course of their lifetime many more sums than the actual underlying principal. I mean, it's also worth asking, I mean, the structural question I think is really interesting. I don't know if we have um, this graphic, but there's been a billion, Forbes billionaires list that's been circulating around the internet over the last day or so, which points out that the richest people in the world, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, um, Bernard Arnault, Bill Gates, and Mark Zuckerberg. And on the left, the right-hand column, this is the really interesting part, it's how much their wealth has increased just since 2020. So Jeff Bezos is not just a billionaire. He's gotten $64 billion richer since 2020. Elon Musk is not just a billionaire. He's gotten $126.4 billion richer since 2020. So what is going on with our economic system? We're in the middle of a crisis where millions of Americans lose their jobs, lose substantial parts of their wealth. It's exactly at that time that the rich get richer. And you know, left economists point out that there's a relationship between the massive uh, accumulation of wealth at the top and the immiseration of the working class, because it is, in fact, those dollars that are being generated and earned by their labor that are increasingly extracted out through policy decisions that go to the very, very top. And as we've pointed out many times on this show, the um, uh, first COVID relief bill was the largest upward transfer of wealth in American history. And even though many people applaud the fact that Biden's, that, 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 that I guess Trump's approach to that, that the general approach to the COVID crisis was so much better handled in terms of distributing some funds to working people as compared to the 2008 financial crisis, and I think that's true, we're still in a world where accidentally, somehow, the people who benefited the most from that were the billionaire class. Meanwhile, the people who got a handful of uh, you know, two thousand dollar checks or what have you are being told that they're responsible for massive inflation. None of these billionaires who got many tens of billion dollars richer. Right. Well, I mean, the area where in which we agree is that to the extent this wealth is you know accumulated by subsidies and bailouts and the playing field being rigged in their favor and all the sorts of things that occurred in the certainly as a result of. Uh, the financial crisis and, again, to some extent during COVID, are things that areas where right populists and left populists can agree on what needs to be done. And it's frustrating that uh, you, you are up against so many vested financial powerful interests that fight tooth and nail to keep the advantages that they've you know, written into the system in their favor that we don't want them to have. Um, you know, whether that, I mean, you don't want to just sound pessimistic, like this can't be fixed, it's sad, it's bad. It, you know, that's not a, it's a, a, a sad reality to confront. So I'm, you know, always glad to hear people like Tucker and RFK Jr. kind of, you know, discussing some of those things um, to the extent that they do. From a policy perspective though, right? I, we, I asked him on the show, RFK Jr., I believe the first time he came on if he supported a wealth tax. Um, and I don't want to mischaracterize his answer, but my impression was that was not a political priority for him. I asked him whether he was concerned about um, the influence of money in politics and whether or not he would forego um, donations from billionaires, super PACs, take a no corporate money pledge. He said he would not. Um, so talking about this, you know, I don't, haven't seen any evidence, I tried to pull up his policy page really quickly. I don't see anything where he's actually advocated for a bill that would cap credit card interest rates. I would love to see him having dialogues with some of the leftists who are currently in Congress about whether or not that they, whether they would partner or, with him or support that sort of a thing. This isn't fiction, right? He's not reinventing the wheel. There are, there are genuine left po populists in the world who have been advocating for these kind of policies. And so it does feel to me, I, I got to say, a little bit like lip service when there's a lot of energy and excitement around somebody saying something as though they invented it like Athena springing from Zeus's head. You know, if this was really a policy priority for you, where were you in 2019? Where were you for all of the years that progressives have been fighting tooth and nail to get something like this through Congress? I mean, he's still ostensibly running as a Democrat, so maybe the, the policies you're um, spelling out are 
thinks he should talk about to win Democratic voters. Um, and do more, do more left like media. It seems like he might be actually running to be an independent or Republican candidate yeah. of some kind, in which case some of the policies you're describing are less you know, politically salient. Well, even if he's their... independent, Bernie Sanders has notably crossed the aisle and sponsored bills with Josh Howley and the like, particularly in the area of, of foreign policy, but also in some of these economic populist type of issues. So, you know, I, I, I would love to see that because it would make me believe it's more serious. I don't care who he partners with, but the idea of making allusions to p policies that are actually in effect, as opposed to kind of just saying things, the way that Trump just said things about he, how he would have done things differently if he were president when NAFTA was being passed. He would have done things differently. Okay, well, what he did in effect was pass a tax cut, the overwhelming majority of which went to the top 1% and which added, what, $1.7 trillion to the deficit. Right. So that's, I, I'm skeptical because I've been burned, not because I'm wishing ill or want to be overly cynical about RFK Jr., but I do think the American people deserve to have a little bit more concrete, concreteness, I don't know, some more certainty to the promises that are being made by politicians on the stump. Hmm. We'll have more rising right after this.